Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of Number 4 Privet Drive were proud to say they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious, because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Mr. Dursley was the director of a firm called Grunnings, which made drills. He was a big, beefy man with hardly any neck, although he did have a very large moustache. Some parents go further. They become so blinded by adoration they manage to convince themselves their child has qualities of genius. Well, there is nothing very wrong with all this. It's the way of the world. It is only when the parents begin telling us about the brilliance of their own revolting offspring that we start shouting, Bring us a basin! We're going to be sick! Grover tried to calm me down. It's okay. I like peanut butter. He dodged another piece of Nancy's lunch. That's it. I started to get up, but Grover pulled me back to my seat. You're already on probation, he reminded me. You know who will get blamed if anything happens. After this was done... Ma began the work that belonged to that day. Each day had its own proper work. Ma used to say, Wash on Monday, iron on Tuesday, mend on Wednesday, churn on Thursday, clean on Friday, bake on Saturday, rest on Sunday. It was often said, in other families, that long ago one of the Took ancestors must have taken a fairy wife. That was, of course, absurd, but certainly there was still something not entirely hobbit-like about them, and once in a while members of the Took clan would go and have adventures. From the upper deck of the ferry, Stink peered through his spyglass with one eye. The eye not covered with a pirate patch, that is. All he could see was blue, blue, blue. Blue sky, blue water, blue... T-shirt? His sister, Judy Moody, was blocking his view. Hey, Judy, you make a better door than a window. When Judy moved, Stink focused his spyglass on the horizon. I think I see it, said Stink. Vegetable Island. I mean, Artichoke Island. You mean Ocracoke Island, Judy corrected him. Whatever, said Stink. The owl frowned with worry. He recognized that howl. That's that mean old Rasputin out looking for any trouble he can find. Every living creature shook with fear as they made their way quickly back to the safety of their dens before the evil old wolf could catch them and eat them up. The fierce howl came again, this time drawing closer. I noticed that the water was calm, and this gave me something to feel good about. No waves meant no resistance, which meant I could swim farther, right? I also noticed that the water was fresh, not salty, which meant that I had to be in a lake instead of an ocean, and lakes are smaller than oceans. Okay, a big lake is just as dangerous as an ocean, but come on, you got a problem with me trying to look on the bright side? I also noticed that I could see the bottom. That very month was September, as fine as you could ask. A day or two later, a rumor, probably started by the knowledgeable Sam, was spread that there were going to be fireworks such as had not been seen in the Shire for nigh on a century. An odd-looking wagon laden with odd-looking packages rolled into Hobbiton one evening and toiled up the hill to Bag End. It was driven by dwarves with long beards and deep hoods. A sense of insufferable gloom pervaded my spirit. I say insufferable for the feeling was unrelieved by any of that half-pleasurable sentiment with which the mind usually receives even the sternest natural images of the desolate are terrible sights. Tom! Tom, you in there? Tom! Tom! Oh, what's he done with that? Wonder. You, Tom! Oh, land sakes! The old lady pulled her spectacles down and looked over them about the room. Once upon a time, the wife of a rich man fell ill, and as she felt her end approaching, she called her only daughter to her bedside and said, Dear child, be good and ever kind, and good things will happen for you. 
and I shall look down from heaven, and I shall take care of you. The Summer of Saving Peep Three things in human life are important. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. And the third is to be kind. Henry James One sunny afternoon in June, my sister Jenny and I were walking home from school when we noticed a loud chirping coming from an empty trash can on the curb. We walked over to it and peered inside. A sad little sparrow was sitting at the bottom of the trash can, chirping his heart out. Father brought home to us a small toy, which would lift itself into the air. We built a number of copies of this toy, which flew successfully. Orville Wright They weren't always two serious-looking men in starched collars and dark hats. In fact, as boys, Orville and Wilbur Wright were typical brothers, teasing each other, disagreeing on any and all topics. This is why I will not be using my guru's name throughout this book, because I cannot speak for her. Her teachings speak best for themselves. Nor will I reveal either the name or the location of her ashram, thereby sparing that fine institution publicity which it may have neither the interest in nor the resources for managing. The first to point this out was an Italian art historian named Federico Zeri, who served on the Getty's Board of Trustees. When Zeri was taken down to the museum's restoration studio to see the Kuros in December of 1983, he found himself staring at the sculpture's fingernails. In a way he couldn't immediately articulate, they seemed wrong to him. But if there is just one practical, common-sense course of that kind, given for adults in even one college in the land, it has escaped my attention up to the present writing. The University of Chicago and the United YMCA schools conducted a survey to determine what adults want to study. But most important, we'd always keep sight of our larger goal, the constant search for methods that affirm the dignity and humanity of both parents and children. Archaeological discoveries dating back hundreds of thousands of years have found community meeting sites where our ancestors gathered around fire. In every culture on earth, as language developed, people learned to share their stories, hopes, and dreams. 